did you know God never had a bad day? <laughs> Aren't you glad? <laughs> I mean, really. Imagine if God had a bad day. Now, <laughs> I can understand you having a bad day. Matter of fact, most people I know usually have some good days, you know. Well, you know, that's good. And some bad days, you know, that's not so good. <laughs> But as part of human nature, there's kind of like, you know, good days and bad days and days. You know, there are days, boy, are there days. But you know what I'm saying. Aren't you glad that God doesn't have a bad day? Imagine what that would be like. Oh, I'm sure that some people would say that it was a bad day when Jesus died. But Jesus came in order to die. So he had volunteered beforehand, knowing what was going to be part of the plan in order to accomplish everything that he did in the plan that God had from the beginning of creation. And so he really wasn't all that shook up about, you know, going through that day that he died. Now, in some ways, we could say that, you know, maybe that was a bad day. But with what was accomplished, I kind of look at it as a good day. And that's what God is able to do. You see, for Him, since this is the day that the Lord has made, it is a good day. Because when God created such as He did, He created and saw that it was good. He made sure or He saw, based upon His own nature, that it was good. because. When God makes something, it's perfect. Now, you may look around and go, uh, where? <laughs> well, that's kind of because you're looking at it from an imperfect point of view. You can't see the perfection because of the direction you're looking from. See, whenever you're looking from a certain direction, you know, from the down looking up, everything looks bigger than it is. It's so often when you look from above, looking down, everything's smaller. Funny how that works, isn't it? When you're above something, it looks smaller, and when you're below something, it looks bigger. It's kind of like when you're under sin, it looks so big, you know, that it's going to overwhelm you. But when you're above sin, you know, it kind of looks like, man, that ain't nothing to worry about. It's kind of like what Jesus said that one day when Satan was revealed, you know, we would kind of like go, huh, that's Satan? Huh. <laughs> Jeez. Once you're above something, then you don't see it the same way as when you're under something or beneath something or something's overwhelmed you or over you. And a lot of times that's what happens to our perspective once we get above it rather than below it. Perspectives are interesting. You know, when I went to Israel, I had this great idea of what I was going to see. You know, I was oh so really worked up. You know, I was hyped. Matter of fact, people had told me, oh, the mountains all around Jerusalem. <laughs> I had already lived in Alaska, so when I got to Jerusalem, I didn't find any mountains. <laughs> it wasn't quite what I expected it to be. When I uh, had heard about the walls of Jerusalem and how the armies had onslaught them, you know, and I thought, whoa, it must be like massive, you know, giant structures, you know, and I had grown up, you know, in like California and the United States, been in Alaska and all over the place. You know, I'd seen some pretty big, massive structures. When I got to Jerusalem, you know, it's kind of like when I saw the walls, man, they weren't that impressive. I'm sure there were some big stones, but I'd seen bigger. So it was kind of like, yeah, it was, you know, okay. You know, I kind of went, yeah, I got the perspective. You know, when I heard, heard about the Galilee, you know, and what it was going to be like, I thought, wow, this will be cool. I'm going to where Jesus was at, you know, and like the lake, you know, it's going to be huge, you know. And, well, you know, I grew up kind of like, you know, around Lake Elsinore that dried up once, but, you know, a lot of bunch were uh, around a bunch of lakes, you know, that were bigger than the Sea of Galilee. And, Sure, I went swimming in it, you know, and I camped out, you know, up in the mountains or the hills around, you know, Gennesaret and, and uh, the Galil, you know, and 
and stayed overnight with some bros from you know Calvary, uh, I think Calvary, Italy at the time. But you know, I, I wound up living in Israel, in other words, for a year. So I got a chance to kind of go around and see everything, basically. And quite frankly, everywhere I went, nothing was as big or as huge or as over the top as what I thought it was supposed to be. Because you see, I was under the impression that things were bigger than what they were. You know, because I had grown up in kind of a Hollywood style. Everything was always greater, bigger, bolder. And that may be where you're at. Maybe you think of everything in your life in a bigger, bolder, greater way than what they really are. Sometimes things aren't as big as you think they are once you get above them and you see where God sees them from. Our perspective is often limited by the direction with which we are viewing it from because of the way that we choose to look at things. We can put on, you know, great magnifying glasses and everything comes very clear. It's like, wow, look at the cracks in that table. Oh, that's rocks. Okay, the rocks are supposed to have cracks. Okay, well, we got it. Slate, you know, or stone inset. But boy, looking at, you know, you and I, Man, look at the sin in your life. Ooh, let me put on my magnifying glasses. Wow, look how big that sin is in your life. And you know, from my perspective, it's a pretty big sin there you got. You know, it's like, wow, that's big without the glasses on. That's sin. But you know, when you look at it from a different perspective, like God's perspective, it's not such a big deal. You know, he kind of took care of the world, you know, like all of sin, once and for all. He says, sin, poof, who cares? <laughs> I took care of that a long time ago. And you see, the perspective of being under it as of being over it often will change your attitude about it. Once you realize that you've been forgiven, then when you do sin, you're easily asking God to make aware to you your forgiveness by asking for mercy and grace. You're given grace because that's how God operates. He wants you to know you're forgiven. So he extends grace to you so that when you sin, which you will, because you're corrupted, you know, you're a corrupt little turkey, you know, you've been running around like kind of messed up, huh? You know, it's in your DNA, literally. <laughs> Corruption of your DNA and RNA, you know, and the river nucleic acids, you know, have been so misarranged and misaligned that you have like this corruptible that has to put on, or incorruptible, that has to put on corruptible so that you can live forever because otherwise, you know, your body would have healed itself and you'd be past sin and moving on into eternity. But because you're kind of like affected in your soul and your spirit, we don't want your body to go into eternity. So it's been corrupted so that it would die. Even as God promised that the sin that so easily affects us, that the soul that sins shall surely die. It's been corrupted so that it would die. Death is a corruption. But once death has been removed, then it's incorruption. Your corruption puts on incorruption. You get a new kind of SNA. You see, you have a DNA, you know, and that's your deoxyribonucleic acids, and you have an RNA, which is your ribonucleic acids, you know, and that kind of makes up your body, you know, and your soul, you know, it's kind of like, whether you know it or not, one half of that, you know, little hexamonical, whatever, you know, spherical kind of thing, you know, that you always see people talk about when they get into the NAs, you know. <laughs> And that's what you are, an N.A. <laughs> we won't go too far with that one. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> point being is that you know, one half of it is kind of like you know your soul, the other half is kind of like your spirit, you know, or so flesh. And so the flesh and the soul kind of get joined together. But once they get separated, you know, guess what? Your soul goes to be with you know God, and your flesh gets to be back to the earth from which you came. And you know you're, you know, you could make this you know kind of like a real RNA, DNA, SNA, and it's not Saturday Night Live, but it's your spiritual connection. And so there's more to it than just the RNA, DNA, but there's the SNA, such as our analogy goes. But the point of it being is that once you realize, once you grab a hold of that thought, you know that there's more to your perspective of the way you look at things than what you realize. You can often find from a person's perspective where they're coming from based upon what they're under or what they're over. If they've gotten over themselves or over this issue of, you know, like, oh my God, 
you know, looking at things with magnifying glasses, then they take things with a grain of salt. They kind of take the time, you know, to sit back, you know, to relax, you know, take it easy, to think about it, you know, they, they'll grab a cup of coffee, you know, and they'll go, well, you know, let me think about it for a while, let me, let me talk to God about it, let me see his perspective on it, and they'll look at it from God's perspective, and then maybe they might go, well, you tell me what you see, and they might listen to you and hear your perspective, and then they might kind of go, well, let's look at it from a different perspective and see it from someone else's point of view. And once you begin to assemble that kind of looking at something, you begin to realize it's not such a big deal after all. It's not such a problem after all. When I look at, you know, when I was living in Israel, when I looked at those things that were so blown out of proportion by people telling me how big they were, you know, it kind of ruined the experience for me at first. But then as I lived there, I began to look at it from a different point of view, from the perspective of someone who lived there and wasn't a tourist. I quit going to the tourist sites and I began to go to the sites where I lived and had to exchange things like buy bread or buy eggs or buy meat or buy you know some of the great falafels you know and all the other food that I used to eat all over the place. I used to go to the Arab quarter, the Jewish quarter, the Christian quarter, you know, because I could pretty much go anywhere I wanted to. So, you know, I kind of went all over the place. You know, and places most people wouldn't go. God knows. <laughs> Woo! You know, <laughs> there's one little place, let me tell you about it, in the Arab quarter, but anyways, we won't go there. <laughs> you know, and boy, there was, that was a pretty strange experience. But my point is, looking at it from a different perspective will often change the direction with which you're evaluating what God is, who God is, and how you should be, as opposed to what you are in life today. Change your perspective. Change your point of view. Take off the magnifying glasses. Don't be blown out because somebody's blown up or exaggerated greatly some of the things that they feel is important to them, when in reality, if you take the time to think about it, you'll find it's not that big a deal if you sleep on it. You know, and consider it in the morning, because we're told that sorrow endures for but an evening, but joy cometh in the morning. And often when you look at it from first thing in the morning with God, you'll see things in a different light than you would have at night, when everything looks so bright, and yet in the daytime, once the sun has begun to rise, it looks completely different once you're out of the dark and into the light. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. Underneath are the everlasting arms. When Peter saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said, O thou of little faith, why did you doubt? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him, and the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. He that touches you, touches the apple of his eye. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. I often see people, you know, blow out of proportion, get carried away, get worried about, get caught up into, oh my God, you know, there was a robbery down the street, you know, so I need to put in, you know, like, mega walls, mega chains, mega bars, you know, to protect my possessions, you know. I need to have the latest, greatest, you know, security alarm system. I need to get, you know, not just a 357 Magnum, but I need to go out and get me like a... Oh, I was trying to think what that new gun was. It was a... <laughs> 50 caliber. There we go. The 50 caliber gun. You know, it's like, instead of it being like a huh, 50 caliber... Uh, I think it was 50 caliber. Was it 50 caliber? 357? Yeah, it must be 50 caliber. It's that new gun that's like a cannon. You know, it actually used to be a rifle. You know, they used to shoot buffalo with. And 
when I was in Alaska, my my boss, you know, he had the he used to get all the latest, greatest guns, you know, because he had Glocks and he had Uzis and all this stuff. Because Alaskans are weird, you know, they collect things like guns. You know, so anyways, in his gun safe, you know, he had all these weapons, you know. He uh, went out and bought the latest because Alaskans get more money and they know what to do with, so they spend it in weird ways, you know. So they don't know what to do with their money. But they, he went out and bought a that new. It was a few years back, but it was a new 50 caliber gun that you know is. The kickback, I guess they designed it in such a way that it doesn't, you know, kick back. You know, it's a, it's a gun that you can actually use it as a gun instead of, you know, like a rifle. And it was pretty powerful, you know. It could take down a bear, no problem, you know. Once you shot one, you know, with exploding shells or whatever, you know, to use, he had exploding shells. You know, you didn't have to worry about, you know, bears. Now, of course, that's what everybody said they bought their guns for. Oh, well, you know, we got to go out and get an Uzi for a bear. Right, <laughs> sure you do. We got to go out and get the you know new 50 caliber gun. I mean, you know, it was a hand pistol, you know, for bear. Yeah, right. You know, and every now and then they'd go out and they would show each other the guns. They never shot them. You know, they'd show them in their case. You know, and like, yeah, see that man? Oh, wow. You know, have you seen my 50 caliber machine gun from back in you know Nam? You know, and you know these guys. You know, they were. Quite frankly, you know, because they were on the international border so close, they could buy weapons from around the world because there was a gun dealer down the street. You know, and he sold weapons from all over the world. Why? I don't know. But the point being is that people get carried away often by their own emotions as opposed to their devotions. And that's what the difference is between being above something and being below something. You see, when something you're kind of like below something, it's easy to puff up or blow up or get carried away about something. But when you're above something, you look at it and it's like, not such a big deal. When you realize that God is in control, nothing else really is that big a deal. Because you know, quite frankly, you either trust Him with everything or you really can't trust Him for anything.